When we think of human trafficking, it's tempting to see it as a sad story, a real shame, but nothing you can do much about. You imagine it as a over there problem. My next guest is evidence that human trafficking is neither over there nor a helpless cause. By the time she was 12, she had run away from home, dropped out of school, and fled blindly into the arms of a pimp. After years of being trafficked, she was able to escape, graduate from UCLA with a law degree and an MBA, and become an attorney working to help at-risk youth and end the infrastructure behind human trafficking. Today, she's going to unmask the corporate characters behind the scenes and share why she chose her unique approach to ending trafficking, leveraging life experience, making the invisible known, kicking ass and taking names, Carissa Phelps. Thank you, Merida. Thanks for having me on. You advocate for this cause often. So you're having lots and lots of conversations with people about this. What do people misunderstand about trafficking the most? What are we getting wrong? I think there's a misconception about sex work and it being empowering. What the common misconception is when I talk to many people who care about human rights issues, they often want to believe that people are making a way for themselves through sex work. And that is rarely, rarely the case. So I think a lot of us still have the images from, you know, that Liam Neeson movie taken (laughs) in our head. Like the characters are still so strong. The naive spring breakers, the Eastern European men mysteriously running things from a card table in a dingy apartment. What's the real picture of who's involved with human trafficking? Can you give some real examples to bring it home a little bit more? Well, the really sad truth is sometimes this is generational. I mean, we know that trauma is generational. The very common, unfortunate story that I hear is, my mom was a hoe, so I'm going to be a hoe. My mom was this, so I'm going to be this. And so it, it just really is an unfortunate story because breaking that cycle is difficult to do when that's so embedded in somebody. We're not coming at this, this issue, this breaking this cycle of trauma, I think, in the right way yet. We don't really fully understand it. We don't want to hear the answers. We don't really want to hear what's going on deeply for them, that they are identifying as somebody who can be used or sold, uh, that we discard people when we talk about labor trafficking, that we say some people are not worth our time or effort or energy. Um, Some people don't have the full potential that we see in others. You know, we, we have things in our constitution that say we're all created equal, but then we do the things in our economics that don't don't recognize that. Hollywood is going to make Hollywood films about all topics the way that Hollywood makes films, the way that filmmakers make films to get people to watch them, to have them have an arc, a story, and to make it, you know, have that build up and the happy ending, right? American filmmaking, at least the happy, the happy part at the end that everything goes as, as according to plan that um, Liam Nielsen says saves the day that there's some sort of you know, redemption, that all survivors will be healed, that everything will be great. And what I see every day is the pain, the suffering, the inability to even walk out the door, the inability to interact, to have gainful employment, to have family lives, to to escape abuse, to escape multiple relationships where they think they're being loved, but they're not because it's been so confused to escape drug addiction and, and really the the type of complex trauma that causes somebody to be unable to fulfill their own potential in their own lives. And so I see the truer story, which is not a Hollywood film. And I see it every day, unfortunately. And who are the traffickers in real life? Can you give real examples? Are you allowed to give real examples of who the traffickers have turned out to be in the cases that you've worked on? Well, so the cases that I've worked on, we don't name traffickers in most of our cases, in most of our cases. Now, if you're talking about somebody that, um, it's not my case, but Abercrombie and Fitch and their business and there's executives there who are trafficking young men to get them to do the things that they want for their purposes and for their profit, they could be executives like that. So I don't want to misconstrue who are the traffickers. They're not street level pimps. They're not all street level pimps that oftentimes grew up in their own generational trauma that oftentimes got this handed to them as the only opportunity or the only way out. That's not the only people we see as traffickers. There are traffickers in executive offices. There are traffickers who have private airplanes. They have modeling companies. They have 
financial companies like Epstein. So we know that traffickers exist along a whole spectrum. It's not just one type of trafficker. So you're saying the the word trafficker, it applies to everyone from the street level pimp to the the company CEO who knows what's going on, but is turning a blind eye. Absolutely. Just how we've applied the law hasn't been the same all of the time. And so, you know, some people find telling and retelling their own story as an important part of their process, but you have a different perspective. Yeah. So I think my story and sharing my story was something I had to do when I did it. So I needed to share my story because people weren't talking about it. People weren't talking about human trafficking. They were still saying, you know, child prostitution. I was going into court as an advocate at the time in law school, going into court with young women who were being charged at 14 years old with prostitution and being busted in prostitution stings. These were young girls. So I needed to share my story so I could say, me too. This happened to me and it is happening to us as children who are thrown into the probation system, the criminal justice system, and then forgotten all about. So I needed to bring light to it and sharing my story was for a purpose. And when I did, I shared in depth. I shared stories from my family. I, my family participated in a documentary. My mother and my father both did. And I, and I really, I exposed a lot of things that I think were very common, but also they weren't the worst of the streets because I've seen so much worse now. So now that I've shared my story, I've heard from others who have experienced far worse than me. So for myself, you know, I was kidnapped. I was held by a trafficker. I was introduced to the terms prostitution and sex, selling sex in my own home before I was introduced to it on the street. So there were, there were things that are common with others that, you know, I, I know other girls are kidnapped as well. I know they're drugged. I was drugged. Those things happen. So sharing those and then sharing them in the context of a solution. So I was arrested. I don't want kids being arrested anymore. I was arrested at 12 years old and locked up for longer than the person who had kidnapped me and brutally raped me. So I, I do share that story for a purpose. I don't share it for, you know, sympathy. I, I really want to people to hear it and say, what are we doing now that's still causing those types of problems? Because what happened is I was on a path to death or prison. That was where I was going. And without anybody really knowing who I was or what's what I had been through. So do you feel like telling and retelling, like telling your story once was what you needed? But a lot of people, when they go around trying to raise awareness about human trafficking, they will recount their story every time. Do you have a specific reason that yes. that's not your personal choice? Yeah, I think it could re-traumatize. I think you end up reliving it. You bring up and you focus in on a lot of the negative things of your life. And I've had so many positive things happen in my life since then that I think I, at this point in my life and moving forward even, that I would like to focus on the positive and on the future. And I want to model that for others. Because if I start modeling to someone who has just exited trafficking, that they need to tell their story and tell it again and again and again, they will never be able to have all of those, you know, that whole decade I had when I didn't even share my story at all. I, I became a college student like everybody else. I tried to blend in as much as I possibly could. I interacted without having to share my story with everybody. And I don't want that for other survivors. I don't think that if, if they're on a path or on a calling to do good work in this field, and it's because of what they went through, then they get to process that along the way, however they feel fit. But I really want to give the opportunity for people not to just be asked, you know, what happened to you? Yeah. If I put myself in the shoes of somebody who has had those experiences and all I see modeled is a, you know, a touring of their story, a touring of the trauma for awareness sakes, I, I could see where that would be really discouraging and it would feel limiting because it looks as though that is my only option for what's that, whatever's next. So I might as well stay here. That's a really interesting perspective. I'm, I'm really glad that you shared that. I want to go back to something that you mentioned real quickly, which was when you were sharing your story, you did a documentary and your family participated, but then you also shared that your family, there was abuse in your home um, 
kind of alluding to that your family were knowing participants in it, but then they were also knowing participants in the documentary. Did I get that wrong? Well, I think what happened, you know, in my family, just like with generational trauma, my mom was abandoned when she was five with with four other siblings and her parents were alcoholics. And so there was trauma, early, early childhood trauma on her. Uh, she was running away by 14 and pregnant by 15, having my sister by 16, my oldest sister. And my dad was not much older than that. And so they, you know, six children later ended up not making it, not making it together. And I ended up with a stepfather in my home. And it was my stepfather who offered my sister uh, $50 to rub his back without her shirt on, right? That first introduced this idea that someone is going to pay you money. And then he offered to find somebody who would buy her virginity. So that was the common, that was a story I was hit, hit with at 11 years old because my sister escaped it and she instead decided to help protect me by saying, you know, you need to protect yourself. I want you to know this, that you're going to be growing up, you're going to be developing, I want you to be safe. And so I ended up with that information, starting to act out, not having anybody to talk to about it and ran away. I, I ended up leaving. I first tried to live with my biological father, also couldn't speak to him. Um, he had a home that was full of pornography. I know people see it every day now online and think it's harmless, but it did impact me seeing that what he was consuming, the types of pornography that he was consuming, one of which was with a father and a, and a teenage daughter. And so that and being shown to it by my brother, not my father, but still that was all happening where I was supposed to be safe. And this is the information I was getting. And so when I ended up on the streets, it was kind of like, well, it's better that this is happening out here than at home. It's better that this is people that aren't related to me because somehow that would minimize some of my trauma. Now, I've seen it where it's happened in the home where traffickers or it's interfamilial trafficking, right? That's a different story. And like I said, everybody has unique, unique things that they're reasons why they may be vulnerable or exposed. But there are, there are some studies that say early exposure to trafficking and normalizing of it in some way is dangerous and is a risk factor. So how did you escape? The first time that I got away from the violent person who held me, he wasn't the first trafficker, but he was somebody that was clearly very violent. Um, they, he was you know, abusive and wanted to basically get rid of me because I wasn't doing the things that he thought I should be doing. I, I wasn't working. I wasn't making him the money he thought I should be making him. And so I was a child. I was frozen. I was, you know, not catatonic, not like where I wouldn't speak, but I was afraid to speak and I wouldn't do the things that he wanted me to do because I wasn't developed or mature enough to do them. So he was definitely taking me to kill me. Like, and I had no, I had no way of running or escaping. I was totally frozen. I was in the backseat of a car and that car was pulled over. And so when that car was pulled over, the police officer did see that something was off. Like, this is, this is not right. This girl, this, these two people in the front, these three, actually it was another woman that was being trafficked, definitely they knew of, and another little girl who was only 15 to my right that I couldn't even speak to or know her name. And I was in the middle of the seat and he got me out of the car, started asking questions, and I lied. Like I was programmed to do already. I'm 18. The cops weren't my friends. I told them I'd already at that time been to juvenile hall. I'd already been locked up. I'm not going to tell him the whole truth, right? Especially sitting in the backseat of a police car with a gun in between us. It wasn't necessarily like a model child advocacy interview, right? Like a, the child advocacy centers have now that you're aware of. And, I, and I, I did not want to be rescued. That's the key thing right here, right? I was not saying, help me, help me to him. But he did get me out of the situation then this is where the training, the sharing in the context of the solution, right? The training fell off. He, he got me out of that situation. He took me to the juvenile hall and he dropped me off. He didn't tell them, look where I just found her. We need to get her to a hospital for a, you know, rape kit for, for a forensic interview. We need to get these things done. Instead, he just dropped me off. And then all the evidence that was there got put into a plastic bag, put away. I got showered and then processed and booked and locked up. And I sat there for 30 days in juvenile hall because no group home wanted me because I was a runner. So after going through all the things I went through, now I'm rejected, 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 rejected. 
finally one took me, you know, I did do drop-ins at school, like continuation school. They would put me in school. We'd figure out ways to run away from the group home. We still weren't perfect kids, right? We were still acting out a lot of our trauma, but eventually I would end up on the streets again. And so this kept on happening. It was just a cycle for many years. And then, you know, it wasn't like I was out one day. It wasn't like that. I got off probation because I moved out of state to Florida with my dad and I, I left and I, I was able to get off probation that way. It was sort of a strategy, but I didn't go to school. He didn't enroll me in school. I did the shopping and the cooking and the cleaning and I, I found other things to do. I made friends, but I didn't go to school and I didn't start to go back to school until the 10th grade when I went back to uh, California with my mom. You said your dad. Is that your biological dad? Yeah, or my your biological stepdad? dad. Mm, wow. I'm so glad that you shared those points because for people who aren't close to situations like this, it's so easy for us to, you know, like I said in the intro, just see these things as like a shame, but you can't do anything. But also as the victim's fault, like, well, why didn't she just run away? Right. You know, we grow up with these these fairy tales that there's a good guy and there's a bad guy and you choose right or you choose wrong and that those are permanent and linear paths, right? And we don't really often allow ourselves to hear the stories that are a little bit more nuanced. And when kids run away, the story is almost always nuanced. And uh, I'm, I'm so glad that you're sharing this and, and tackling it from a really unique perspective, from a law perspective, from the capitalism perspective. So tell me what what laws allow you to prosecute corporations that are allowing human trafficking within their organizations or, or within the buildings that they have? So the Traffic Victim Protection Act says, and it's a U.S. law that's enacted under anti-slavery legislation. So it's very important. It's It's embedded in the Constitution that we are not promoters of slavery. We shouldn't benefit from slavery, profit from it. So this Traffic Victim Protection Act and Traffic Victim Protection Reauthorization Act is Congress's power to enforce that. That's basically what it is. And so this law, 1595, is a civil cause of action for the victims themselves, for the survivors themselves, to bring a cause of action against anyone who was in the chain of the trafficking. So that could have been the buyer's they could be civilly liable. And I think that's something that really needs to get out there. It could be all the people supporting the buyers. So renting them the hotel rooms, getting them the, the services that they need to engage in sex trafficking or labor trafficking as well. So there are people that are, that are benefiting from trafficking as like the purchasers of people in sex trafficking and labor trafficking and domestic servitude. So the receivers of those benefits are receiving something and they are part of that trafficking ecosystem that exists, ecosystem, right? So it's not yeah, just, and yeah. it's not just buyer, trafficker, or victim. There's this whole outside ecosystem that, that services the buyer or that services the trafficker or that even services the victim sometimes, right? And makes money from the victim. I saw this in the red light district in the windows in um, Amsterdam, where there are people there with catalogs continually selling them things that are part of the sex trafficking that they're, they're sitting and taking profit from something that in our laws if they knew that there was a trafficker involved in that, they would be held liable for accepting those types of profits from trafficking. So anyone benefiting from servicing this whole trafficking ecosystem that happens. And in terms of hotels, we know that those are often used and it could be, could be Airbnbs, vacation rentals, things like that as well that could be used for trafficking. And we're seeing more of that as well, but locations are necessary, right? To, yeah. and, and I've even see, uh, seen reports of sheds being used for sex trafficking, for videos being made for places where videos are shared and sex trafficking goes on in that way as well. And, and so these, these assets, whether it's dirt, four walls, the, the running water, the bed, you know, they're necessary for trafficking to go on. And the victim has a right to go and make a claim because they've been harmed. Now they have these damages, these long you know, mental and physical damages that they have to go back in that entire chain and say, who benefited, who profited from my trafficking? And they will oftentimes have hotel receipts, bookings, 
Um, they'll have interacted with staff. Some staff sometimes even participate in the trafficking with individuals. So hotels are sort of, I would almost say, the lower hanging fruit. We brought cases against websites, and unfortunately, that some of those have gone really bad because congressional protections of websites and judicial protections now through through precedent setting, you know, cases that are really bad law that are protecting internet companies from being liable for for sex trafficking when the people have spoken that they should be and that they're, the laws just aren't being enforced because they're getting immunity from these lawsuits, the, the internet companies. J.P. Morgan was sued for helping give Epstein his assets to engage in trafficking and all of the things he was doing that was being helped and funded by them, providing those assets. So they, it could be, again, the direct trafficker and the assets that they use through their own companies like Abercrombie and Fitch and the executives there that were involved in it. But there was a third party involved in it as well that they were aware of. So once you have the awareness that somebody is being trafficked or even you should have known, you knew or should have known that trafficking was going on and you're accepting benefit from it, then you can be held civilly liable um, and have punitive damages, legal fees, everything taken from you. Yeah, it sounds a lot like how the opioid crisis, you know, I was just just got off a call with a guy who um, was part of a pill mill in Georgia in like the in 2010, I want to say. And everyone went to jail. The mm -hmm. receptionist went to jail. Mm -hmm. The doctor went to jail. The you know, every everyone went to jail. Um, and it also reminds me a little bit of the. Well, when I think about the the participants, right, the institutions that are established that allow this to go on. I also think about the banks. Is that something that is able to be pursued legally, like the banking system that allows, um, what was one of the hotels you said? Red Roof Inn, mm -hmm. that allows Red Roof Inn to, to participate in human trafficking. Will they be liable? That's a possibility. I mean, we're proving those cases up now. I mean, we are, we are trying to prove those cases. And it's not that the, the victim is going to be able to say, you know, you bank, you hurt me directly, right? This is an indirect harm from what the bank set up. So it's a very complex case because we do have to prove that our client was injured, but by whom? And they don't always know. It could be steps removed. So the bank could have provided the financing to someone who knew, who, had, who they should have known was our, was engaged in trafficking, right? Were they already a property owner that was engaged in trafficking and they're doing a brand switch and then they're getting funding for that through a bank? That could be a possibility. They're getting support I, and management funding through that bank. I, I think it's so interesting that you decided to take this corporate route as opposed to like the nonprofit route because you, I mean, you're just like off the top of your head. You're like spitting out, oh, and this is, and this is connected. And, you know, you are so well versed in the intricacies of how corporations hide this shady bit of business. And it just makes me wonder why we haven't had <laughs> someone like you before. You're like the Aaron Brockovich of, <laughs> of human trafficking. We needed you like a long time ago. So I'm glad you're here now. Except with the what license about... to practice law. But um, uh... <laughs> yes, yes, that's an important So I mean, feature. if she had, See, the, I think she the would details. have been more explosive in terms of on the scene. But I think getting to know the the survivor and the victim side of it and being compassionate there could be where I stop. I mean, it could it could just burn you out. And I think that's the reality of this work is that it's hard. The reason I'm coming on here and speaking and reaching out to people is because we need more help. That's what I need to say to people, right, is that in your profession, whatever it is, we need your help. We need your help to understand what this is. We need your help to stop consuming things that support trafficking. So whether it's labor trafficking or sex trafficking or domestic servitude, all these forms of trafficking that are involved and they, they are so complex and there's so much of a web going on that we need everybody's help to try to make our country what it was designed to be, what it was supposed to be, which is a place where people are free and free to reach their own potential like I have been able to. I don't want I don't well, want to stop at the victim service. I know how important they are and I want other people yeah. to be able to do them and I want to get funding for them and I want to I want to basically dismantle creating more victims. Just the people that have, you know, the power and the resources can make a change. They won't well, yeah. unless they're accountable for it and it becomes a line item that they start to become concerned about 
or unless their investors become concerned about it. Then we can get them concerned about it. And that's how we get them to care. I mean, no one is signing up for in their profession. Oh, yeah, I love whack-a-mole. Let me just let me sign up for some of that. Like if you're in a profession where it's public interest and you like whack-a-mole, it could be argued that you're doing it more to feel good about yourself than you are to end the travesty that you're trying to go after, right? Like you want to work yourself out of a job. That right. is the point. Right. And so this is the perfect time to talk about how we can help, what we can do as just regular people. I can't tell you how many times I've walked through the airport and there's that announcement. Yeah. If you suspect that you see human traffic, I'm like, what the fuck is anyone supposed to do with that? Like, I appreciate that they make that announcement, but like, really, what are we supposed to do with that? So tell me, please, how is the average person supposed to recognize human trafficking, thing one? And thing two, what can we do about it when we think we see it? So I am I am one of those people, and I see it so often because I know it, because I, I know all the red flags and the signs of it. And for me, what is so difficult is people that support it. So they continue to support it. They support it through music. They support it through what they listen to, what they purchase. Wait, wait. So how, how, let's break that down. Cause I'm sure you're like, oh, I say this all the time. People already know. We don't know. How do you support human trafficking through music? There are a number of artists, I don't have to call them out by name, but there are a number of artists who make money by promoting what they think is um, a transactional event. So I sell my body, I get a bag in return or I get something in return. And Pretty Woman did this too. So it's, it's part of our culture that we think that there's this trade-off that can happen with our bodies for some material thing. So, so are you talking about lyrics? Yes, I'm talking about lyrics. So music okay. that it contains, so we will listen to it, we'll consume it, we'll think that it's so cool, we'll be on the dance floor with it, it's got a great beat, right? And we're letting it just consume our youth, our culture, we really are. We're not talking about it critically. So when I train social workers or people who are transporting kids around, they'll say, well, they want to put their music on, right? They want to put the music that they want to listen to on. Well, is that an opportunity for a conversation? Is that an opportunity to say something about what those lyrics say and really try to dismantle them? Because it's so difficult to get that out of somebody's head. It's like a programming, right? When cults use music and they use beats to program somebody, mm -hmm. it's like a programming. This just becomes something that's normalized. When Backpage.com was online, that was something that youth were telling me, well, how could this be illegal? This, it's online. The police see it. It's everywhere. How could this be illegal? This is something that, you know, it's out there. Why wouldn't they stop it if it was illegal? So the more we normalize the purchasing of sex, the more that it's going to be out there. So right now there's a YouTube channel that's advertising a street in New York where you could, you could buy people. They, they're advertising it on YouTube, right? They're getting buyers and it's in Spanish and they're advertising to buyers to come and purchase people from this street, purchase sex acts, specific types of sex acts on this street. And those are oftentimes their victims that are on that street that can't escape because their documents have been taken, they're indebted, they came for another reason, they can't house or feed their families. There's things going on there that are uh, more complex that we can't get to them fast enough, but they're being advertised on YouTube. Why is that available? Why does that channel stay up when YouTube can shut down channels if it has a copyright violation, but then that could stay up? So are we doing something about the things that are like right in front of us? So to your point of if you see human trafficking happening, what are you going to do about it? Well, the first thing that you can do about it is look around and how that you could say something about it. You could do something about it. You can report that YouTube channel. You can not participate in those lyrics or those songs. And I, I think that when you say what can you do about it, I just want to go back to who are you? What do you do? Like you are in media. So you do this. So you're bringing me on. You can bring other survivors on who have more complex stories to tell that have something to share that shed more true light on the story. So I think that's an important piece of it, that you're doing what you can do right now. Um, and you may not be able to do that in the middle of the airport, right? Yeah. When, what, <laughs> what do you do in the middle of the airport? When you what see you trafficking. To do? So I think like if yeah. you're in, cause you usually hear it in Atlanta and, and yeah. yes. And that's a Delta hub, right? So every Delta mm -hmm. staff is trained on how to respond to trafficking. 
So finding any Delta staff is probably not the best thing to do. It's best to find one that has a red coat on because the red coat is somebody who is like a supervisor in that field. It would all, uh, be great to have a security officer that you could tell as well, because at that point, you've then, you saw it, you said something, that's what you're supposed to do to who, right? If you see something, say something, and the kind of idea is to who, and what will they do yeah. next? And then that's the responsibility of the experts who are in the field to teach them how to interact, how to have a survivor, somebody who's trauma-informed, a therapist, people that are available to reach out and to make a connection with that person that's a victim. Do you feel like pornography perpetuates trafficking? Absolutely. From the buyer side, it creates demand for it. It's a place where traffickers advertise. Oftentimes, it's a place where their, their videos are released to threaten somebody or to hold them in trafficking because now there's an embarrassment. I'll let this out to everybody if you tell or if you go someplace. And there's a feeling of guilt even and remorse. Um, and even if somebody makes, quote, money off of it, it could feel empowering. And then that's, that's brainwashing the victim even more. I think it's a difficult, complex thing in terms of how OnlyFans is run and those places where we know sex trafficking is happening and it's more difficult to uncover because it's happening in real time. The, the, that's an advertising place as well. And advertising for trafficking is illegal. So they're being looked at. I mean, everybody, everybody who um, promotes sex work online runs this risk of advertising for trafficking. And they would have to totally clear out their pipeline and say, am I involved in trafficking at all? Because you should know that if you're advertising for sex or for pornography, that that has become an, an advertising avenue for traffickers. Interesting. I have a question that I want to ask you that I, I'll warn you, this is a hard transition. This is a no transition, mm -hmm. but it's a question that I really wanted to ask you because so far you've really been outside of the scope of what I have experienced as far as typical advocates to end human trafficking. Okay. Um, especially so like Christian based organizations, there's a lot of them, right. That work to end human trafficking, which is wonderful, but I'm uneasy with the juxtaposition of an organized religion, promoting purity culture and also supporting women coming out of trafficking. Because I worry that like the shame impact may come as a consolation prize for the support. Do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, I, so I am, I'm Christian. I'm Catholic. I believe in, you know, the, the Holy Trinity. And I feel that everybody has their own faith walk that they're going to go through. And in healing, it's a part of it we can't ignore. We can't ignore the faith component of it. It is not the only component. It was oftentimes the things that saved me were divine intervention. And I will talk to other survivors and they will say the same thing. It was divine intervention that saved them. Now, does that mean that a, that a woman or man-made uh, program is going to be the rescuer? No, because that's man-made. That's, that's, not, that's not what we're talking about when we say divine intervention. It'll be a time, a place, something happened, and you just know that the Holy Spirit is behind this and there's something that's guiding you out and call it what you will, but you are being saved and then you're being saved for a purpose. There's something that is there on the other side of this for you. But in terms of preaching that to others, I let them preach it to me. I say, what is your faith? What is your background? What do you believe in? What do you believe in still? When was God there for you? When, when, when did it feel like God wasn't there for you? So we could have those conversations. We can't ignore them. That would be like me ignoring gushing blood coming out of somebody and not taking them in for any help, right? We can't ignore that we need the spiritual guidance and the spiritual help because this is a, this is a spiritual crime as much as it is a physical crime. When you tell somebody that they are worthless, when they are no value, when they belong to you, they're, you're taking away their God-given right more than their even nationally given right for, from this country. So to ignore it and to say we don't need their help is a mistake, you know, but that's not the only component we have. We still have the physical wounds. We still have the mental health, the emotional health that, I, that prayerfully would, would encompass, right, with the spiritual components as well. But it's not the only way, and it's definitely not going to work in a Puritan sense. <laughs> um, it's just not, it, it, you know, it will, it will no. turn people off more than anything. Well, you know, we... You've talked in other interviews about uh, the oath that you take as an attorney, but you take one when you're a doctor, you take one when you're a counselor. 
I don't know that ministers take one, but I think the idea is there to do no harm, right? So my unease with um, religious organizations is that they don't come out and say, and by the way, we consider abstinence and being a virgin as the only way to be pure before God. And then that, of course, that causes harm. So mm-hmm. that's that's why I get a little, I'm just not too sure about it. Like, I'm glad that they're helping. I'm glad that they're offering services. But it's kind of like once the person gets the services, they have been programmed by the people who traffic to them to behave in line with whatever that, like you talked about. Cults. No, we don't like, want further like brainwashing. No further brainwashing, yeah, yeah, yeah. please. No further exactly. brainwashing. No further. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and religious organizations can have a tendency to do that. People don't know that they might be doing it. They might be overzealous yeah. about the religious components of it. And religion to me is totally different than spiritual. So those are different. And so saying to somebody, you can only get help if you accept Jesus. I think that's wrong. I, I do. I think to say to somebody, you know, what is your relationship with the spiritual? What is your belief now? It's just honoring where they're at and meeting them where they're at is, is the starting off point. And in terms of me putting my beliefs on them, I mean, that's not what I want to do. I want to say to them, this is why I think it's valuable. This is why I think it's helpful. This is what it's done for me. I could definitely say that in my own testimony. And I can do the same thing about spiritual. I could say why it was helpful for me, why these beliefs you know, help drive what I'm doing, why it may help break the generational trauma if you go in this direction. But giving it without any reason is judgment. And that's, I, I, I stand against judgment for sure. Yeah, I love that. Um, as we close, can you share how people can get more education on how to recognize human trafficking and get more education on knowing what to do when they see it? Because sometimes it's just like a a little moment in time, right? And you just don't know, you don't know what to do. And so um, if you could tell people how to get more knowledge and where they can keep up with all the, the advocacy work that you're doing, that'd be great. Yeah. I mean, I want to give you links. That's what I want to do because there's so much available yeah. online and then for different fields. So there's heal trafficking that is wonderful for healthcare providers. There is a pair model that was developed by a survivor. That's all kinds of trauma that people interact with when they're in the medical field. So I think those types of things, you know, specific for medical, we could have a few links for those, for people with that background. And then we can have first responder sort of training. So you're in, you know, firefighting, your EMT, you're the type of person that's going to have more interaction with them, then we could interact, we give you some links for people and for places that can give you more education in that area. And then there are people who are in the education, you know, they're, they're educators, they need something to give students to teach them about some of the things that are going on in terms of having meaningful conversations with them about, you know, what, what slavery and trafficking looks like today. So I think um, all those things, you know, I want to provide you like the different categories because they're so robust and they're so great. There's so many things that are great right now that weren't there five, 10, even three years ago because of, you know, some of the, some of the things that are available. I, they're just, they're, they're just amazing. And, and then the survivor component. So now there's survivor alliances just coming out with, with a guide on how to work with survivors. So let's say you wanted to hire a survivor that's an intern that is interested in doing podcasts or something like that and work with you. Now there's a guide for that that is developed by survivors. So there's more that I want to give to you than just one website or one place to go. Thank you for that. Please send all those to me. I'll put them in the episode description and then I'll also put them in my, my Saturday email as well. I appreciate you so much. Thank you again for everything. And uh, I, I hope to see more of this come to an end. Thank you. And, and me too.